Uh, today we're going to go on with 1D mechanics, uh, falling balls, falling cones, friction. Uh, what we find is that when we use the laws of mechanics, we get to differential equations. Sometimes you can solve them with pencil and paper, sometimes you cannot. Uh, last time we talked about this problem about a particle falling in honey. So we have gravity force pulling the thing down and we have some kind of friction pushing it up, assuming it's falling down, pushing it down if it's, falling, if it's going up. The way we do mechanics problems is we draw a free body diagram. We're going to be very strict about these in this course. What is the free body diagram? It's all of the external forces acting on the system of interest. What do we have is we have gravity and a drag force. How do you think about it? I'd like you to get used to this exercise as you go up to the system with a scalpel or a chainsaw. <coughs> you cut it free from everything that's around it. Every time you cut it free, you have to fool it. The only way to fool things in mechanics is with forces. So you cut away the earth and fool it into thinking the earth is there with the gravity force. You cut away the fluid and you fool it by showing the drag force. There's an issue with keeping track of signs of things. If you write a scalar without a vector notation next to an arrow, it means that scalar multiplied by a unit vector in the direction of the arrow. So here we have an upwards force, which is in the minus x direction, which is the force of drag. If we say the drag <coughs> is just some constant times the speed, then it's in the correct direction if the speed is positive. And then if the speed is a negative number, say v is th minus 3 meters per second, then when we plug in this formula, we have a minus sign. We have a minus sign multiplying a unit vector in that direction, and that will give us a net positive force. So the signs will work out. On the other hand, when things are moving quickly, the drag is not a linear drag, it's a quadratic drag. And most uh, engineering purposes at the large scale, we deal with quadratic drag. So if you want to know how baseballs move, ping pong balls, footballs, cars, bicycles, forces on people when they're running, uh, uh, in general, most of the things sort of at human scale, uh, the drag is a quadratic drag. Why is that? It's the physics of drag is a little different. It's not about push pushing through the viscous material, it's about throwing the material away and it has to do with inertia and the kinetic energy that's being thrown away and it works out to be proportional to v squared. Now why does that work out to be v squared? You probably saw a superficial explanation of that in high school physics or freshman physics and you will learn in detail about that in a fluid mechanics class. But here we're not interested so much in the fluid but how the solid moves. And you should just know there are these two different kind of drag laws. Moving through honey, when you're pushing through goo and the force is roughly proportional to the speed, and moving at big speeds with big objects and less viscous fluid, and you've got to throw this fluid away, and the force is proportional to v squared. So here's this quadratic drag, which is called inertial drag, quadratic drag. What separates these two cases is how viscous the fluid is, how big the object is, how much the inertia is, and there's a special number that separates that out called Reynolds number, which is, again, is not the topic of this course, but just to give you the vocabulary, at high Reynolds number, you use a quadratic drag. At low Reynolds number, a viscous drag. Now, when we look at the quadratic drag, if the thing is going fast, or if the thing is large, or if it's moving through a fluid which is not very viscous, we want to write v squared. But if we put a v squared here, v squared is always a positive number. So we'd get the drag force always in that direction, whether it was going up or down. And we want this thing to work if you happen to throw the ball up. And if you throw the ball up, the drag is not going to be helping it. So we need to get a negative number here when you throw the ball up. And you fix that by writing v squared this way, v times the absolute value of v, which is just v squared if v is positive, but it's negative v squared if v is negative, which gives you the right direction for the force. You don't need that fix over here because when v is negative, the force is negative. It all works out. Okay, so it's a little tricky thing about dealing with quadratic drag. Okay, now, yesterday when I set this up, Tuesday when I set this up, I said we just had a constant times speed, but that constant depends on stuff. What the fluid is, what the solid is, how big it is. Uh, so how does it depend on stuff? There's a usual scaling that people use, which is that uh, the bigger something is, the bigger the viscous drag, and it scales with the area, the same way that, that um, force... Uh, scales with stress times area is kind of the same effect because the viscosity times a shear rate gives you a stress. Then there's this viscosity which is a material property like honey is viscosity is big, 
uh, water viscosity is small. And then there's a shape effect. Certain things have different drags than other effects. And usually you think of this number as being somewhere near to one, maybe a half, but uh, maybe two, but something near to one. For quadratic drag, there's the same kind of formula that the drag force is proportional to v squared, but the bigger something is, the bigger drag force. And again, it scares, scales with area, because how much material you're going to be throwing away as you, as you push through it. And, but it doesn't now depend on the viscosity. It depends on the density of the fluid. So this rho f is the density of the fluid. And then there's a drag coefficient, which is different for different objects. For example, an old-fashioned car, the drag coefficient is something like 1. And a super streamlined car, the drag coefficient is something like 0.1. So it varies in the neighborhood of one, streamlined things much less than one, really blunt, badly shaped things in the neighborhood of one. OK, so that's the basic physics of this problem. But now if we want to understand the mechanics, how does this actually move, we have to take this, use the laws of mechanics, get a differential equation, and then solve the differential equation, which I did last time uh, kind of graphically. And I'm going to repeat that, but now I'm going to do it a little more uh, technically. So let's take the linear viscous case. And I'm just going to take this collection of terms and call it C. So I'll say C is equal to C D, uh, this viscosity, times the area. Because I don't want to have to carry around this complicated constant all the time. Then I want to write our linear momentum balance equation, by which I mean that forces are equal to the rate of change of linear momentum. In that case, I write that as the sum of the forces is the mass times the acceleration. And since we're only doing 1D mechanics, I'm not bothering with the careful vector notation, which we're going to be very strict about later on. The forces in the positive x direction we have are mg. And we have also a drag force of minus CV in the positive x direction. That's the drag constant times the speed pointed in the direction of the upwards arrow, which is the minus x direction. And this is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which in this case was v dot. So we can write this various ways. One way, which is my favorite way, is to write it as v dot equals, uh, let's see, we've got a g on this side. And then we have a minus uh, c over mv. That's my favorite way because it gives us this crystal ball interpretation of things that differential equations tell us about how to predict the future. But it's not the favorite way for people who take uh, differential equations classes. They like to write this as v dot uh, plus c over m v is equal to uh, g. So this is, this, is, uh, this is for crystal balls. How do you spell crystal? Is that CR or CHR? What? CR crystal ball. Or another way to think about it is for a numerical solution. This is if we want to think about the differential equation predicting the future. And this is for uh, math ODE types. So the difference between these two ways of writing the same equation, this way we put the highest derivative on the left, everything else on the right. This way we put everything that has the a dependent variable on the left, everything else on the right. OK, now we'd like to know how this thing moves. One thing is we also have an equation that v is equal to x dot. Because we, we don't just care about speed, we care about where the ball is in time. And that's uh, not much of a reorganization. But we can write x dot equals v, putting the highest derivative on the left side. So we think of this as a way of predicting the future. If you know the velocity, it tells you how x advances. OK, now we'd like to solve uh, these equations. How do we go about solving them? One thing is you can look at this, and you can say, that's way complicated. Look, there's dots and variables all over the place. I give up. I'm going to do it on the computer. That's usually what happens. 
Now this happens to be one, if you look at it, you don't have to do that, but let's get to that usual case. That usual case will deal with the computer, and we're going to start doing that on Tuesday. So the warning is, brush up on MATLAB before Tuesday, because most of Tuesday's lecture is going to be about solving differential equations on the computer. Okay, so you've got to be ready for uh, MATLAB. Okay, but today I'm not going to do that. I'm going to um, try to solve this like this. So how do we solve this? Is we can say that V of T is a what's called a homogeneous solution plus a particular solution. How many, how many people, I don't have this set up because of that thief took my stuff. Uh, how many people um, do not know what that means? How many people do know what that means? Okay, so now we want to get these two solutions for this differential, differential equation. So let's start out with this one. Now as you say you want to find the particular solution, it's really you want to find a particular solution, and really what that means is you want to find any old solution, and what you need to write here is any solution to the differential equation you can find. That's what this means. Any, any solution you can find what it usually means in practice is find the simplest solution you can find. So you're going to find any solution to the different questions, any old solution, any particular solution, the particular solution, any old solution. Okay. Work in pairs. Well, I set up my computer and figure out what some solution of this differential equation is. The simplest solution you can find, don't worry about initial conditions, don't worry about position, just any solution you can find to that differential equation. I'd like some candidate solutions. Raise your hand if you think you have a solution. Yes, what do you think you have? What do you have? V particular equals mg over c. Any other candidates? Somebody get something different. Okay, so we're going to take our first eye clicker poll. You vote A, B, C, D, or E, depending on whether you think the one candidate solution that you cooked up was right or something else is right. Okay. All those who didn't vote yet, vote. We've got here pretty good three seconds left. Okay, I'm going to lock up the vote. It's locked up supposedly, and I get to pick which is the right answer by going like this. Is it D? Is it E? I say it's A. Okay, I like that solution. Okay, do, now anybody want to want to uh, vote for, give lobby for B? It could, you know, there's psychological warfare in this whole thing, which is that I am going to try to trick you sometimes. Like, I know I've taught this class lots of times. I know what mistakes you, all these people out there, what kind of mistakes you make. Uh, but this time I wasn't. Okay, what's the nature of this solution? We want to find any solution to this differential equation. What's the simplest thing we know? Well, we know when we drop something, eventually it reaches a constant speed. So one of the solutions is constant speed. What's constant speed? That's no acceleration. So we just put zero here, and we say, oh, V is equal to this thing, then V dot equals zero. That solves this differential equation. V is a constant, uh, and this is what the constant is, it's mg over c. Any questions about that? Okay, now we need to find a, a homogeneous solution. Now, since I gave you so much time, some of you must have found a homogeneous solution. Who did find a homogeneous solution to this? Yes? E to the negative. Uh, C over M T. And now is that the general homogeneous solution or a homogeneous solution? What? Any, any opinions on that? Okay, the homogeneous solution means you take your differential equation, you put zero over here, and you find a solution to that equation. 
finding any solution is finding a homogeneous solution, and finding the most general solution is finding the, the general homogeneous solution. <laughs> what you want is the general homogeneous solution. So the general homogeneous solution has a C here, but I better not call it C, I call it C1. Okay. Now, how can you get from here to there? Well, you, you've got a zero here, you can put one thing on the other side, you can multiply by dt, you can divide by v, separation of variables, integrate both sides, you have logs, then once you integrate you have the logs, then you unlog it and you get exponentials and here's what you get. Or, you remember the solution of this differential equation, which you could say is memorization, or you could say that it's something that you can just know. So what, one way of looking at this equation is that it's v dot equals minus dv. This is the homogeneous equation written just to make it uh, 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 simpler. That is, take all the constants and put them together. And you say, what does this mean? It means the rate of change something is proportional to how big it is, only negative. So when it's big, it gets small fast. When it's small, it gets small slower. When it's negative, it gets bigger. Whatever it is, it decays. It heads towards zero. So if you just picture this intuitively, it tells you you have to have an exponential decay. Something like exponential decay, and then you remember, oh, it has, actually is exponential decay. How fast is it? Well, the bigger this d is, the faster it is. The d here is exactly this c over m here. So this thing has to be uh, a solution that goes like e to the minus dt. But it works no matter how big it is, so there's some constant here like that. Okay, so that's how you can just remember the solution. It's not memorization, it's picturing what the solution is, and once you've got that picture, exponential decay, it tells you the solution. Okay, so now that we've got all that, we have that our V of T is equal to our uh, homogeneous solution plus our particular solution. So that's some constant any constant we want, multiply by e to the minus c over m t, and then we have plus our particular so solution, which was uh, uh, g. Um, what was the particular solution? Was mg over c. By the way, does this make sense? Let's see. It says we have a steady solution. The bigger the gravity constant is, the faster it should go. The bigger the mass is, the faster it should go. The more gooey the stuff is, the slower it should go. So that makes sense too. Okay, so here's our general solution. Now we've got this unknown constant in the solution. How do we find the constant? Well, we've got some initial conditions. I sees. What are the initial conditions? Well, let's just say we drop this thing from rest. So we said V of zero is equal to zero. That means when we plug in t equal to zero into this thing, we have to get uh, zero. So if we plug t equals zero in this, this thing turns into one. It means this constant has to balance this constant. So this then implies that v of t is equal to mg over c times one minus e to the minus c over mt. Okay, now we've got V, but remember when we started this problem, it actually was a second order differential equation in disguise. Or it wasn't in disguise, it was a first order differential in disguise. It was a second order differential equation with X double dot. We just noticed that there was no X in it, so we could write a differential equation with V, but we're actually trying to solve the second order differential equation. So we want to find out what X is. So what is X? x is equal to the value of x at time equal to zero plus the integral from zero to t of the velocity as a function of the dummy variable t prime d t prime. So we want to integrate one more time to get the uh, position. Now we have x is zero, we have the initial condition that x is zero is equal to zero. So we have that x of t is equal to the integral from zero to t of this thing, this velocity as a function of t. Now we want to think of it as t prime, a dummy variable, because we're going to add it up over all time. So we have mg 
over C, 1 minus E to the minus C over M T prime, all, all D T prime. Okay, now we need to do this integration. And what do we get? For this term, we get m g uh, over c t prime evaluated at 0 and t. And then for this other term, we get the integral of this, which is we have a minus sign here, which comes out front, and we have a minus sign here, and they cancel to give a plus sign. So we have an e to the minus c over m t. And then if you, when you differentiate, c over m comes out front. When you integrate, m over c comes out front. So we have an m over c, but we still have this one multiplying in front of it, which was an m g over c. So we have this product of terms like so. And then this thing, we also have to evaluate between 0 and t. Okay, so now what do we have for x of t? We have the first term evaluated between 0 and t, but at 0, the first term gives 0. t prime evaluated at 0, so we just have mg over ct. Then we have a second term, but the second term has two parts because we've devaluated t and at 0, and at 0 it does not drop out. Let's do the 0 one first. If we evaluate this thing at 0, this thing is 1, so we have m squared g over c squared with a minus sign. Uh, with a minus sign. And then we have plus uh, m squared g over c squared times e to the minus c over m t. Now if we want to think about these as three graphs, this graph plus this graph plus this graph we can get some understanding about what the solution is. This graph looks like this. So here's a graph with a straight line with a slope of m g over c. This graph looks like this, where we have a value here of m squared g over c squared with a minus sign. And then this graph looks like uh, this is some exponential decay. And here's t. Then we want to add those three graphs together. And it tells us the same thing we got in class last time, that we have this graph, which we're adding to this graph, which gives us, when we add those two together, it gives us this graph. But we're adding to that another graph, which is this exponential decay, which is this graph. So what we get is something which goes like this. So this is our uh, solution. Here we have this slope. The slope is how fast it goes in steady state, which was mg over c. Uh, we have this delay time, which is this characteristic time which is m over c. And we have this offset, which is how far it is behind, uh, how far it is behind uh, a particle which was flying by and got launched at the same time. And it's how far behind is m squared g over c squared. OK, so this was the thing that we got intuitively last class.
But don't get too optimistic about these analytic methods. We have to just change the problem a little bit, and the problem gets very difficult. For example, if we did quadratic drag in this problem, you can do it, but the algebra is a mess. So it's sort of an optional problem for the homework uh, next week is to do this problem with quadratic drag. Um, and it's a mess. If I just made it a little more complicated, added a spring to it, quadratic drag, something like that, you can't do it. I can't do it, nobody can do it. Most differential equations, nobody can solve algebraically. That doesn't mean they don't have a solution. It means that there's no formula for the solution. There's some function of time which solves it, but there's no formula for it in terms of exponentials and square roots and so on. Just like there are integrals that you can't integrate. I don't know if you noticed in calculus class, some of them got hard. If you made a mistake, they got really hard, so you looked them up in Wolfram Alpha or on your, on your, on your uh, algebraic calculator or with Mathematica, and then if they get a little harder, you look them up and nobody can do it. Wolfram Alpha can't do it, nobody can do it. And same with differential equations. Most of them, nobody can do. Okay. I heard from ATA that at least one of you was depressed after the last class that, that here you are and you took statics most of you like statics we voted on that and I said now you're taking a class which is opposed to statics is not useful so I'd like to correct that a little bit which is the statics and strength of materials classes has formulas in it that people use those formulas directly in engineering is useful in that way this class, the formulas that you're going to learn, people do not use those so much directly in engineering. But this class is useful in that you are going to get skills, which are generally useful, and the dynamics, if you go on and learn more stuff, is useful. It's just in itself in this package, it's not useful. The third thing is that this class is more cool than statics. It's just more fun and interesting and stuff like that. So separate from can you grind away in some Dilbert office cubicle and calculate stresses uh, that's what 202 is good for this one you get to do fun exciting stuff like figure out how particle how piece of salt falls in a honey jar gotta use salt instead of sugar because sugar dissolves as it goes okay any questions about this example okay so let me start Another example. I feel like I'm going to maybe run out of board space, so I'll prepare for that. Think about a question. Try to ask one when I'm done erasing this board. Anything on this board anybody has questions about? Okay. Okay. Questions now? Okay, one thing we can look at with this problem we just did is a units check. So this pretty strange formulas we got, and c squared and m squared and stuff like that. So we can do a units check on it. For example, what are the units of this drag constant c? Well, the nature of this drag constant c is it gave a force in terms of velocity. So the units of this drag constant c were the units of force divided by velocity. What is force? Force is got units of mass times acceleration, which is length over t squared, and then we're dividing by length over time. So then what are the units of this c quantity? We have length cancels out, length cancels out, time squared sits on the bottom. We have mass over time. Well, that's a nice thing because let's look at all the analytic solutions we have we have always in our analytic solutions things like this in the exponentials. So this implies that the units of uh, C over M T are 1, which is dimensionless. 
And that's good because the arguments of transcendental functions of uh, signs and exponentials have to be dimensionless. So if you ever do a calculation where the argument of the sine or a cosine or of an exponential is not dimensionless, you made a mistake. Powers can be dimensional, but exponentials can't because there's no way to manipulate the units. Into an exponential a sine wave comes a number, out comes a number. It can't be in goes some unit, out comes a num unit. It doesn't know how to work. Those things don't know how to work with units. And you'll see if you have a dimensional quantity as an argument to a sine, it doesn't work out because when you differentiate it, some coefficient comes out front with units. And if, if, it, if and it's got to be a 1 over time that comes out, otherwise the, the, uh, the rest of the dimensions in the equation won't work out. Okay, so uh, this works out nice as far as units. What about some of the other uh, features in this uh, solution? Well, we had uh, an m squared g over c squared. That's the suspicious one. What are the units of m squared g over c squared? Remember, that was the thing that came out uh, as something, what units do we want this to have? Well, let's look at what our solution here. Uh, where did I write the solution? Up there, we have m squared g over c squared. That better have units of length. If it doesn't have units of length, we made a mistake, right? Okay, so let's just, let's just check this out. So what are the units in here? We have m squared. g is length over time squared, right? This velocity, derivative of velocity is length over time squared. And then c, we just figured out, has units of mass over time. So we have mass over time, and we have quantity squared. And then we look at this whole thing. We've got a mass squared and a mass squared. We've got a time squared and a time squared. And left over is just length. And that's good because, because uh, x has dimensions of length, which is what we want. Okay, so you can do units check. Units checks are good things, ways to find mistakes. Okay, let me go on and do a, uh, another example, which is Galileo's falling balls, which I mentioned in class last time. And the key idea in this example is we're going to neglect air friction. Okay. So we're going to start out. We're going to neglect air friction. What do we want to do is you want to draw a free body diagram, write f equals ma, look at the differential equations, see how it works. Any questions on this blackboard before it goes away? Uh, one semester I taught this class and at the end one of the comments at the end of the semester was, this class is useless, even the professor said so. So I want to correct that. It's just you can't plug the formulas in directly. Okay, so how do we figure this problem out? This is just a subset of the problem we just did. We pick, we draw some coordinate system and get our signs worked out. We draw a ball. We fool the th ball into thinking the earth is there, we cut it away and fool it with a force, it's mg. We write our linear momentum balance equation, which is always that the sum of the external forces is equal to the total mass times the acceleration. So we have mg equals mv dot. We can cancel this, we get v dot equals g. And the th key thing to notice in that, I'll let you copy that down,
Okay, the key thing to notice is, somebody want to answer the question for me? Yes? There's no mass in there. No m equals mass in the equation. So all balls fall the same. Which was Galileo's discovery. Not such a big discovery. Maybe he could have just solved Newton's equations, except for Newton wasn't alive yet. So he made that discovery, and this inspired Newton to understand things by going backwards, starting with the solution. He said, oh, forces, da-da-da, and came up with F equals MA. Okay. But if, starting with F equals MA, that, that all balls fall the same is something we have to reason. Okay. What if we have balls with friction? So let's do another example. Is balls with air friction. So for this air friction, we're going to use quadratic drag. And now in this problem, I want to compare balls. I don't want to just do the random ball. I want to compare balls. So I want to think about how big they are and things like that. So I'm going to put in uh, the radius of this ball. So I'll have a mass for this ball is going to be uh, 4 thirds pi r cubed times the density of ball material, whatever ball material is, iron or something like that. I'm going to have a area of this ball is going to be pi r squared. Now, why do I say the area is pi over squared? Because for these drag formulas, you don't use the total surface area, you use the cross-sectional area. You see the area that the fluid sees when the ball is coming at, coming at it. Okay, so now we draw a free body diagram of this thing again, which is going to look kind of familiar. So we go like this. We have x going down like this. We draw this ball. We have mg pointing down like this. And we have this force of drag going up like this. So now we write our linear momentum balance equation, which says that the force is equal to the rate of change of linear momentum. The sum of the forces is equal to the rate of change of linear momentum, like that. What are the sum of forces? Well, we had mg minus the force of drag equals mass times acceleration. But now we can substitute in for this mass is 4 thirds pi r cubed, 4 thirds pi r cubed, multiplied by the density of the ball, times g, minus the force of drag. Now the force of drag was some drag coefficient times the area. So let me just write this down so I don't have to crowd it in there. The force of drag was some drag coefficient times the density of the fluid, times the area, times the V, times the absolute value of B. That's what we had before. So we have the CD rho fluid uh, pi r squared V times the absolute value of V, and this whole thing is equal to mV dot. And it looks confusing because all those coefficients are confusing. What did I do wrong? Why is this thing true? Uh, you mean, why is this thing true? OK, the volume of a ball is uh, 4 thirds pi r cubed. That's a capital V, not a velocity. And you multiply the volume by the material density, it gives you the mass. Does that answer your question? OK. OK, so now we can rearrange this equation. It, it says that V dot is equal to 1 over 4 thirds pi r cubed times the density of the ball multiplied by uh, 4 thirds pi r cubed, the density of the uh, ball, times uh, gravity 
uh, minus uh, coefficient of drag times the density of the fluid uh, times pi r squared. Uh, that looks good. And this thing gets multiplied by v times the absolute value of v. OK, now we want to work this thing out. The first term comes out nice. It's just g, which we would, would have expected. That's the acceleration you'd, you'd expect to see when there's no fluid drag. And then the second term, we have a bunch of stuff that we have to subtract. So there's, a, I mean, cancel. We ha so we have something times v times the absolute value of v. And then we have a coefficient of drag. Uh, then we have a pi and a pi, so the pi's cancel. We have a uh, 4 thirds in the bottom here, so that turns into a 3 quarters, which isn't really of, of much concern. But we have a density of fluid. So these things are both going to be the same for any two balls. But then we have a, um, a density of the ball. So we have rho fluid divided by density of the ball. And we have a 1 over r. OK, check my algebra on that. This is the same for all balls. And this is smaller for big balls. So if we take into account air drag, what we see is that all balls, big ones and small ones, have this basic acceleration, but they have a deceleration, something slowing them down, which is less for big balls than for small balls. Small balls have a bigger deceleration. Yes, what did I have wrong here? Um, wouldn't the density of the ball be different for the balls? Oh. I'm the teacher, you're the student. I am declaring that you're only allowed to use pairs of balls made of the same material. <laughs> so when we're going to compare balls made of same material, bigger balls are slowed less by the air. So a bigger ball will fall faster, which is everybody's intuition. For example, if you imagine a big ball made of styrofoam and dropping it, it'll drop about like a basketball. And if you drop a little fleck of styrofoam, it'll just drift to the floor slowly. So this matches your intuition, which is why Galileo's experiment and result was a surprise that you idealize out the air friction and how the balls fall doesn't depend on their size. Now it's hard to make balls of the same material in different sizes, so it's easier to make something with cones to do this experiment. So now we'd like to do this experiment with these paper cones, which, which are on the website. So now we'd like to take another vote is uh, about cones falling. So we want to know, does the big one fall faster? Does the small one fall faster? Do they fall the same? Or is there something more complicated? More subtle somehow? Okay, so we're going to take a new vote on this topic. And you're supposed to vote now about these cones, taking into account your deep understanding of today's lecture. And I, I'm, I, sometimes I intentionally deceive, sometimes I'm intentionally honest. So let me just tell you something that's not deceptive. These things fall in a regime where quadratic drag is important. That is true. 
I'm not lying to you. Okay, I want 10 more votes, please. Vote early, vote often. If you vote often, vote with the right answer repeatedly. Okay, I'm going to end the vote. Vote is ended. Let's look at what you said. There's what you said. The big one's faster, the small one's faster, the same. It's more subtle and complicated. Now, would anybody like to lobby for one of these opinions? Yes. 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 That sounds sensible. Anybody like to argue something different than that? Well, then, I'll let you vote again. Okay, vote quick, please. Okay, voting is going to end in three seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, let's do the experiment. I just want to let you know, before the semester is out, we're going to have the same basic plot, and the person's going to say something wrong. But today, we have a good, smart student. Ready? Isn't that impressive? Okay, so the paper experiment is different from the balls. How is it different from the balls? Is in the ball, the mass was proportional to the radius cubed. For the paper, it's only proportional to the radius squared. So both the gravity force and the friction force scale with the area. So you get the same equations both ways. Okay.